the lap quilting connection. We've had a chance to do some quilting, and now it's time to put our blocks together. The moment of truth, we sometimes call it. You're going to be really encouraged when you see how fast your blocks go as far as quilting because you can take them with you anywhere. I find I take them on a trip with me, doctor's office, and uh, always brings up conversation when you have them with you anyway. It, uh, it's all going to go back to whether or not your templates were placed on your fabric correctly, did you cut out your borders the right size, and did you use your 12-inch block, your pattern on the back of all your blocks. This is all going to come together when we put our blocks together to form our whole quilt. Whether or not you're doing, as Mary Boyce has done, a block-to-block -block assembly with mitered borders or without the borders, we need to discuss this. Mary has done a lovely job with a King's X pattern. She has alternated the basic King's X and the God's Eye design, and she does excellent piecing and lovely quilting. I think you can see this beautiful connection she gets using her oval and doing her double row of quilting at each intersection. It's just lovely. Helen Gage has done a nice job with a block-to-block -block assembly, and this is what we want to talk about also. Helen had a fashion background, and I can see that, that background in this quilt that she's done, a lovely selection, almost a mellow selection of all of her kind of browns, and um, very, very nice selection that she's done here. Let's look at a large quilt. This is a variation of the Jacob's Ladder, but done for a king-size quilt and also using some of the House on the Hill pattern. And all of this has to be grafted out, more or less, so you have a plan. I've had some help from my friends in getting this finished as far as the quilting goes. I had a problem at the corners. Because this quilt will cover both the mattress and the box springs, I went ahead at each corner and made half a block on the diagonal, and that way there won't be such an excess to trip over when you walk around the bed. But this, the core of this quilt has been put together, and now we're going to talk about block-to-block -block assembly at the sewing machine. Before we actually put some blocks together, I want to give you one little tip, which is, means backtracking just a bit. But you remember, after you have your blocks done and you've added mitered borders, if you can, every time you press the back of these blocks, if you can always this diagonal seam that comes from the corner into your block, if you can press it in the same direction, either clockwise or counterclockwise, on the back each time, you will find that when you put your blocks together, for instance, now these are not quilted, but what happens is if those two blocks were going together, I think I can spread this back and you can see what happens, you'll get an, what I call an automatic stagger. In other words, that seam's going that way, that one's going in the opposite direction, and it really works nicely. Another point to, of course, always remember in lap quilting is that you have to leave always at least a half an inch to an inch free of quilting around the outside of your blocks. You cannot quilt up to the edge. There wouldn't be any excess available to put your blocks together. Now, you're probably thinking, what are all these threads hanging here? I call this the dangling or the floating thread. And what it is, is that you quilt up to about that half an inch or an inch and then simply take your needle out and leave it hanging so that once these two blocks have been connected and you've done your handwork on the back side, then you can come back, re-thread your, put your needle in your thread again, and then finish off. That way you don't have all the stops and starts in your quilting and it makes it a more continuous effort. Let's look at putting some blocks together. For instance, these two blocks are ready to go together. Now, you can always, once you've gotten this far, go ahead and, of course, remove any basting stitches that you would have. If you had any marks on that with a fabric marker, this would be the time to get rid of them. And then with your scissors, trim. If there are any excess hanging, go ahead and trim that off, your batting and your backing, all the way down. Now, there's no reason to leave an excess of backing material. A lot of people think you need extra, but after all, you're going to connect that front, your front part of your quilt, which will mean it's going to take up, then you will have extra on the back for your handwork. Now let's put these two together, and I'll give you a better idea of how this will happen. I like to put the two right sides together, and take your corners and pin them. Now, when you do that, you're only working with the front of your quilt. Free the backing. Take and put a pin at each corner. 
And then what happens is if there is any easing to do, you can do it between there. At the same time, you want to, I take this like so, and then put it on a flat surface. Find the midpoint. Now, a new thing that I have been doing that I find works very well is that you can go ahead and machine stitch the batting on one side. In other words, pin the backing all the way free. You don't want that to get caught. Pin that back each place. And then with a pin in the middle, we're going to, this is where we'll actually be doing our machine stitching. Pin the batting. This is on the front side. Pin this back. And so you're more or less stabilizing your block by allowing the batting to be caught on one side. I think it works out very nicely. Of course, if you have a real thick batting, I wouldn't try doing it. But if you have a medium to lightweight batting, I think it works nicely. All right, now we're ready to machine stitch this. Get our pins out of the way. And I think if you're going to be handling these blocks for a long period of time, it works nicely to go ahead and back stitch at each outside edge. It just strengthens it a little bit more. But you will find, take a quarter inch seam allowance, you will find that your batting will move very nicely all along as you're, as it's flowing against the feed dogs. There won't be any problem. You're probably thinking, well, why don't you include that batting? It will not. It'll get caught in the needle of your machine. It really will not work very well at all. It becomes a real problem. Of course, I'd use a compatible thread here. I'd use either a, the off-white. Now, when you get down to the end, free of any batting on the top side, and line this up. And then once again, all the way down, and then you can backstitch. Now, you are ready to go ahead and finish the front of your quilt. Now, what has happened here is then you're going to remove any of your pins, and you are going to see that the weight, the weight of where your batting has gone will want to fall in one direction. You will notice that the weight, the way that has been sewn, will want to fall in this direction. So what you will want to do is trim a little bit of batting, and then this side will go straight, and that is simply going to turn under a quarter of an inch and fall on top. Now, one thing that you're going to find, you must work on a flat surface. I have seen finished quilts, and people have worked them in their lap, and you get this bunchiness in the front here. That just won't do. You have to work on a flat surface, and it does mean trimming a little bit of the batting right here, so it will come up and meet that batting that's falling. And then this seam falls in that direction, and I think it also works nicely to go ahead and base that down a quarter of an inch, turn it under, so then that falls on top of it. Now, there are some times when you will want to have a quilting line all the way down the front of your quilt. If you do that, make sure and do it at this point. Not when that has gone straight and that has folded over so you have a flat lap seam. Wait and let that be back. In fact, keep that pin back, but this one seam has gone straight. Then come over on this side and do your quilting stitch all along that seam. Once that has been done, then come over and fold that under a quarter of an inch and you're ready to finish that connection. Let's look over at this piece and see exactly what would happen here in your block to block assembly. It means letting all your floating threads, dangling threads come free. And once again, I've simply had a chance to pin every place there is a connection very closely. You can see how that just where those V's meet, and once again, the backing stays free, and I go ahead and connect this part, and that's where my machine stitching is going to take place. Now, this little baby quilt that I'm working on, have, we have gotten to the point where we've gotten one row put together, and now we're getting ready to put another row together. I want to actually get my thimble, show you what happens here. This is um, 
baby quilt for an Amish baby. It's kind of <coughs> wild colors here on the back. I think you can see we have machine stitched and we have caught the batting on one side and then working on a flat surface and I have basted one side all the way down the quarter of an inch. Then this side will just fall in this direction but you're going to want to trim once again a little bit of the batting especially if you have a thick batting. If it's a real thin batting it could even just simply fall on top but I think it does work better and you've got to be very careful here. You don't want to cut your quilt at this point. But let the batting fall straight and then this, this will come straight and that will fall on top of it. Now I've seen pictures, diagrams where they show this seam, your connecting seam, actually that's the front of your quilt, where it's been spread open. Well that kind of seems to go against everything we've already learned in quilting, that all of our seams stay closed. So I'd go ahead and let that be a closed seam that's going to fall in one direction. I have found it also works nicely if you will alternate. If all of these have been sewn in this direction, you say that was the way I put it on the machine and the batting was caught at the feed dog. All right, the next row, if you'll do it in the opposite way, so it will fall, all these seams are falling this way. Now, in this particular one, when this, then this is going to be connected like so. Then we look at these, the way this has been connected, and all these seams have been sewn, so they're coming this way, which makes a nice connection when these go together. When these go together here, you already have a staggered connection. I think it makes it very nice. So you have to kind of think ahead as you're working on this. Now, we're at this point and this is coming towards me and this is going back. I like to always work on a flat surface and start pinning in the center. I've, I found that works nice. It more or less balances your whole seam. Pin this and then come like so all the way down. And then once that has all been pinned, I would start sewing down at this end and you want to do a hidden slip stitch. You don't want a, a whip stitch and of course I have used a white thread here so you can, it's more visible to you but naturally on something as dark as this you would use a dark blue or a dark green thread but I can't stress enough how important it is to work on a flat surface and once you've gotten to this point then you're going to start and make sure when you make this connection here that you're simp that this is free here. I'm going to start and I'm going to, I've already put a knot in the end of my thread. I hope you've learned how to do that new knot by now. And I'm going to go ahead and do a slip stitch. I'm going to simply show you this. I want to make sure that here I am not going through to the front of my quilt. What would happen if I, if I connected that? It wouldn't leave me anything free to put this row to the next row. This has got to be left free. And then when I get a little further into the block, I'd say maybe, oh, maybe an inch or two inches, then you can put your hand underneath here and go ahead and do us and do catch some of the batting. It won't hurt. But every once in a while, check, make sure you haven't gone through to the front side of your quilt. That would be a, a disaster, especially if you had a, a dark thread like this. So, so keep doing this and take, I would say, very small, tiny, and pull your thread nice and tight. You want, after all, this is where the strength is going to be. You need to connect this. This is your finishing technique here. One problem that I have noticed sometimes is that in quilts such as this where you have a design on your border, after you have your blocks put together, there will be kind of an elevated area here where the mitered connection has been. You need to come back and go ahead and do a quilting stitch right down here. It will help to flatten and pull that together. After all, you've, you've taken up this area for quilting and now you need to fill more in at the mitered connections. The grandmother's fan takes on an entirely different look when it's done in a block-to-block -block arrangement B. Green has completed all of her blocks and now she's got it more or less drafted out on paper where she wants to go from here. And her next step, let me kind of give you a good view of, of how pretty that's going to look when she starts putting this together. She has to decide, does she want to work 
Actually, it'll be four blocks across and seven down. Does she want to put them together horizontally, that is, four at a time and then connect, or would she like to put seven together and get one row finished and then put another one? She'll have to decide that. It's sometimes you might have a master plan and then you start turning the blocks and you might just change everything in midstream and decide you want a whole nother arrangement in this. Wouldn't that be kind of interesting? That, um, that takes on a whole, a whole new, a whole new uh, idea right here. But what she will have to do here is find her smallest block and that will more or less be the guide for putting the rest of it together. In other words, she wants to trim all of these so they're even, any excess that hangs off, any batting that would extend out, she wants to trim all those and that way she can start putting her two fronts together and machine stitch that. Later on we're going to show about kind of a cute accent she's going to put on around the outside of this quilt and uh, we'll talk about this later. This is a large quilt that I finished this year and I entitled it Home Pieced Home. It is also lap quilted but a whole new idea here we worked in rectangles. The idea being that the whole quilt was based on a three inch square and it's kind of an idea for you. You could take any size square and break it down into as many segments as you, as you can. In other words, the rectangle, two of these rectangles sewn together would form your three inch square. So all of this was based on a three inch square and as you can tell, give you a good look here on the back side, that is where the rectangle has been put together. It's actually, let's see, a huge nine patch but done in rectangles. And this alleviates sometimes the problem, for instance, the Lone Star quilt. When your quilts turn out square, you need to elongate them and add excess at, e at each end. But if you lap quilt in rectangles, I think it works out very nicely. I want to show you another idea called the convertible quilt, a whole new idea in lap piecing. The convertible quilt idea relates to the fact that you can take a patchwork spread and make it work for you in the summertime as just a spread or use a duvet in the wintertime. I had an opportunity to go to London a couple years ago and I was fascinated with the fact that I kept seeing these poochy things hanging out over the line. And finally, when I talked and met several of the quilters over in London, and by the way, they are really organized over in London and they have just had their first exhibit and there is a guild that is formed in London and uh, they're very interested in American piecing and American patchwork so that was a fascinating thing to find out and the girls told me about the duvets and what it is is a large stuffing that goes inside the quilt now the way they have it set up is they do not use a top sheet on their bed and this backing of the, the piece acts as really not only the back of the pillowcase but as the top sheet. It forms the casing that the duvet fits in so that you can slip that in in the winter time and then pull it out for summertime. It can be two pieces of muslin simply sewn together with polyester batting enclosed, a thick batting. Now I'll use the polyester because, oh by the way, this is Paul's preppy quilt and uh, Paul has allergies so I wouldn't want to have down inside his quilt and of course you only use down where it's going to be really cold but the idea here is that you would sew two pieces of muslin together for a down and then have these long channels or panels that you would sew maybe about four inches apart and then you could hang this on a clothesline and then simply stuff your down feathers inside there. Maybe you'd want to go into a closet to do that so there wouldn't be down all over, but, but that's the idea. And one of the secrets in doing this is that your duvet needs to be, the measurements need to be a little bit larger than the actual encasing that it goes inside. Then it won't shift around so much. I think it helps also to sew a little string at each end and then also sew an end inside your pillow casing and that way you can tie them together and they stay together. Let me tell you more about how I made this. I actually went ahead and worked on all the separate blocks and then accented them with a mitered, a solid color, a primary color around each one. Then I added the plaid. So I had all these blocks, well they were a little larger than 18 inches square. Then rather than just leave the raw edges, I went ahead and 
did a muslin backing, I think in time that the raw edges might kind of shift around or might start unraveling. So why not go ahead and secure it with a muslin backing? I used the idea of slip in the ditch, now you've heard of that expression in sewing, where you would actually put a zipper foot on your machine and then you can get real close right in that little kind of channel right there and machine stitched the block to the muslin backing. Then I formed the rows and sewed these together. Now when I first started doing it, I thought, well, I want to hide all my raw edges so I would use a French seam. The problem I developed there was a lot of bulk at the intersections when one row went to the next row. So then I switched and used this little foot on my sewing machine which I can create an overlapping edge and more or less covers that raw edge. I think this gave it a nice finishing touch and keeps it from raveling so much and didn't create so much bulk there. And I'm sure a, a nice close zigzag would do the same thing. But that is the way the convertible quilt idea works. I went ahead and had some tape sewn on here just loose so that after the duvet is inserted, and I think there's a, you can see the little tab here at the end which I also sewed inside. After that is inserted, then you can simply snap these at each end and I think that works very nicely to keep your duvet in place. I like to put those snaps at the bottom of the bed. And that is how that works. I've because Paul doesn't particularly want to take time to make the bed all the time, I went ahead and simply made a pillow sham that would just drop over the end of where the pillows are, and that works nicely too. It simply falls on top of the bed, and that's pretty easy to do. That's the way that would go together. But I think this idea of the duvet would also work with an old patchwork quilt. For instance, if you didn't want to have it quilted and it was in good condition, if you simply put a backing on it, then you could go ahead and insert your duvet and I think it would work nicely. I want to end with a quilt that we were working on a couple of shows ago because it's progressing and it's coming along. We call this the Oh My Stars quilt done in triangles and it's coming together. You're going to see some floating threads and dangling threads still because we haven't quite gotten it all together yet. But I want to make a point about what happens in this large quilt. And it's about this point that you're going to say to yourself, this is a nuisance carrying all this bulk to the machine. But just keep saying, well, yes, but it's already quilted. And I just had this one long line to put together, and then we can talk about what happens around the outside edges. Now, we are at this point, and the moment of truth here is when we line up our stars here and here, are they going to meet? Are they going to be right on target? and it looks like it's, it's going to work out very nicely. There is some bulk that's created here where our seams have come together and what I would suggest doing here would be not to sew down all that excess seam allowance on the back side. I'll make sure and use a navy blue thread to sew this all along here and when I come up to that seam stop and back stitch so that really you have almost a floating seam at the back side. I think that'll work nicely. But Always move these threads way back and then of course this is going to flip all the way over here. And I think I wouldn't be satisfied just to pin this. I think I'd go ahead and baste it too because quite often just pinning can even shift before you get to the sewing machine. But pull all these threads down so they're out of the way and then you want to make sure also that from that raw edge into where that V starts that you've got a good full quarter of an inch and then these two will go together. And I think because of the weight of this, I would start here and go to one end and then come and start here again and then go all the way to the end. So then you'll have some handwork to do on the back side. The, the final thing for this whole quilt will be the outside edge treatment, exactly how you're going to finish off these raw edges. We're going to spend time at our next get together working on the continuous bias tape. The idea that you can form a whole tube. Can you get the idea of, of the tube all the way on the out? It's just one continuous tube so that I will start cutting here and just cut miles and miles of bias tape. I think it's always nice to kind of make a mental note however you learn to do this. For instance, if you start with a 24 inch square 
then make a note and measure the amount of bias tape that you get at the end so you'll always know 24 inch square equals two yards of continuous bias tape. That's what we're going to learn next time, exactly how to do that. Plus, other ideas for finishing your quilt, maybe ruffles around the outside. Or perhaps you finished and your quilt isn't quite large enough. You could add a band all the way around the outside. Then there are prairie points and uh, scallops. The quilt that the grandmother's fan is going to have a nice treatment rather than points. I think of something softer here in this idea. So I want to show you how to do a tiny kind of a loose, almost a scallop edging all the way around the outside of this quilt. We will look forward to seeing you next time. Georgia Bone Steel is the author of the book, Lap Quilting with Georgia Bone Steel, based on this television series. Thank mm -hmm. you.